Today we have the second lecture by Adam Savitsky on geometry of quantum correlations. So Adam, okay. the screen is yours. Yes, thank you, Katya. So this is the part two of my talk. Uh, so two weeks ago we had the, the, the first part. So let me maybe summarize my last slide from the two weeks ago. So uh, in general, we were speaking about quantum states. I actually explained that there are two types of states. They can be pure. We can have pure states and mixed states. And then we started to speak about systems which are composite systems. So they consist of some subsystems. And like the very simple example one can consider is a case when we have a quantum system consisting of just two subsystems and they are uh, <clears throat> described by Hilbert spaces of the same dimension. So this is just tensor product of CD times CD. By the way, do you see my pointer, like this funny hand? On yes. yes, yes, we ah, see okay. it. Yes. Okay, good, because this is important. This is the only way I can like point into formulas. Good, so <clears throat> this is like a, joint Hilbert space of our system, then of course any state, pure state of such a composite system is just some normalized to one vector. And we explained, or actually we, we discussed uh, a little bit about uh, what would be the states of subsystems. They are given by the so-called partial traces. And I actually derived those formulas. So uh, uh, what is the lesson from this is that although the state of the entire system is a pure state, the states of subsystems are mixed states. So although we know everything about our uh, whole system, we do not know everything about its parts or constituents, which is kind of weird from the classical point of view, I would say. And one then defines uh, something which is called entanglement entropy. So this is kind of a measure which tells us how much weirdness we have in our state Psi. And this is given by the sum of uh, von Neumann entropies of those uh, reduced states, row one and row two. And we also discussed how to calculate those this von Neumann entropy and so on. It's like it's just given as a, a, a normal entropy. However, the probabilities that we are taking for the definition uh, of the which we are putting into the definition of normal entropy are eigenvalues of those uh, reduced states row one and row two, and those eigenvalues are such that. Of course, those PIs and QIs, they are summing up to one. So, and they are uh, they are non-negative. So they are really probabilities. Okay. And then if you, <clears throat> then we, uh, uh, I also mentioned that we have those states that we call separable. So uh, these are just states given by simple tensors. And if you take a simple tensor and you calculate calculate its reduced density matrices, those row one and row two, you will find out that they are just projections onto one dimensional subspaces. Uh, and in this case, the eigenvalues are just, uh, uh, just one non-zero eigenvalue, which is one and all other eigenvalues zero for both row one and row two which means that the entanglement entropy is zero. And this is what we would like to have because if a, if a system is in such a state, which is phi one tensor phi two, I know what are exactly states of the subsystems. They are phi one and phi two. So there is no ambiguity here and the entropy should be zero. <coughs> uh, however, if we take a state which is written here, so those uh, E's and so on, they, 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 this e, e, I correspond to basis of the first subspace, F's correspond to the basis of the second subspace. So this is a tensor of the maximal rank, but it's also important that all the coefficients here are the same. So then the corresponding reduced uh, states, so row one and row two are proportional to identity, 
matrix uh, one over d so the probabilities are exactly the same uh so and they are uh, all equal one over d so if you plug it uh, to this formula you will get that this is two log d and this is actually the maximal value of this function which you can achieve and this maximal value is achieved by this particular state so this was like the end of the story which i was telling last time and now what I want to do is I want to somehow relate it to some geometry because to some extent there was not yet any geometry or like uh, uh, there was no geometric picture uh, associated to this story and the title of a talk of the or of those two talks is basically geometry of quantum correlations so there should be some geometry and today I just want to connect it to this geometry. But before maybe I will do it, does anyone have any questions which arise maybe uh, after my first talk two weeks ago and anyone wants to ask about something? Because I think this is a good time to ask if you have any questions that are somehow more quantum related than geometry related because uh, geometry will be now. Okay, if there are no questions, so let's let's move on. So I want to, basically what I want to do is I want to connect this picture to something uh, <laughs> uh, related to symplectic geometry and to actions on symplectic manifolds that preserve symplectic structure. So first of all, <clears throat> I, I want to say a little bit about uh, symmetric symmetries of symplectic spaces and for me, it's also kind of a story which is very classical because from the perspective of anyone who is like a physicist, symplectic geometry, symplectic manifolds and so on, they are natural things which we are learning already at the very beginning of, uh, of physics uh, studies because these are basically phase spaces. All the classical things, I don't know, rolling things, uh, a description of, I don't know, a rotation of uh, Earth around Sun and so on. It's all done with uh, in a phase space. So basically, a symplectic manifold is some natural structure for a physicist, but this is a very classical structure. So <laughs> uh, there is no quantum quantumness in this structure, but we will see that actually there might be some quantum in this description. And this is basically the point of this of today's talk. But uh, let's do it uh, uh, slowly and in uh, in order. So first, <clears throat> a little bit of notation. So I, I'm sure that you all know everything what I will be showing in uh, like next three or four slides because uh, you are all like doing differential geometry and so on. But I have to establish some notation basically. So I need to show those slides. And they will be also important from the perspective of like reminding everyone what is uh, the construction of the momentum map, because this momentum map will play a crucial role in my like connection to geometry between uh, this this quantum story I gave you last time and this this thing which I am going to say uh, to speak about today. Okay, so by m omega I will connect a compact symplectic manifold, which is uh, simply a uh, Manifold on which we have a non-degenerate non uh, two form, which is closed. So this form will be always denoted by omega and uh, the omega is zero. So the fact that this uh, form is non-degenerate non gives us some kind of an, gives us an isomorphism between vector fields on the manifold M and one forms on M and <clears throat> This uh, isomorphism sometimes is denoted by this kind of a musical isomorphism omega with this node. Okay, so for every vector field z, I can associate one form, which is just uh, evaluation of this omega on z, where I'm putting z into the first slot of omega. Good. So then we will say that uh, a vector field is Hamiltonian if the lead derivative of omega in the direction of, of, of this vector field vanishes. And uh, of course, from the physics perspective, Hamiltonian vector fields are very important because uh, of 
the classical mechanics of the Hamilton equations. <clears throat> so there should be some functions connected to those Hamiltonian vector fields. And it's uh, the, so so how how it, how they are connected. So first of all, I will denote by this uh, HAM of M. So uh, all this all, all the Hamiltonian vector fields on my manifold M. And then we have the Cartan formula for the lead derivative of this of the two form, which is given by this formula here. And if I take a Hamiltonian vector field and I connect and I calculate the lead derivative using this formula, then here I have zero. D omega is zero because we are on the symplectic manifold, which means that the D i xi omega is zero. This i xi is this is the insertion. So i xi omega means put xi into the first slot of omega. So d omega xi is zero, which means that omega xi is a closed one four. Okay. So <clears throat> if we now assume that actually uh, our manifold is such that the first cohomology group is uh, trivial. So basically that every closed form is uh, complete. We can find a function f such that the differential of this function will be this d. Uh, so df is equal omega xi, okay? So basically this, so we know from the very beginning, we knew that there is some isomorphism between vector fields and one forms. So Hamiltonian vector fields are such fields that the corresponding one forms are closed. Good. So to every function, so speaking in other words, to every function, I can associate uh, a vector field, which will be denoted by xi f. So function is f, vector field is xi f. And this, uh, <clears throat> and, and we have this, uh, th this realization satisfied. Okay, and then in the, uh, uh, we can also define a Poisson bracket, which is just evaluation of omega on those two vector fields, xi f and xi g, for some two functions f and g. Uh, oh. mm -hmm. oh, sorry. Okay, so this way we are getting a map which is taking us from a space of smooth function of, on M with this Poisson bracket to the vector fields with the commutator of the vector fields, okay? So to every, to every function, I associate Hamiltonian vector field. And then it turns out, it's actually not, not difficult to see it, that this map is actually a homomorphism, homomorphism of Lie algebras, okay? So the commutator of xi f xi g will be the vector field associated to the Poisson bracket of f and g. So this is just uh, uh, some basic story about uh, symplectic manifolds. And now I want to also consider some action of a group on my symplectic manifold. And I will assume that this group is from the very beginning compact and semi-simple, semi okay? So having an action, I mean that I have a smooth map, phi such that if I take phi for any group element, this is a diffeomorphism, and then uh, I have this uh, way of composing uh, things. And uh, the other property which I require is not that this action is any, but this, this action is such that it preserves the symplectic structure, which means that uh, the pullback of omega by phi g, uh, phi g is just omega for every g in k. Okay, so this is a simple, uh, we will call it symplectomorphism. So I have a group which acts by symplectomorphisms on my syntax manifold. And then I can once again uh, distinguish some class of vector fields. Uh, and those vector fields will be called fundamental vector fields and they will be associated to the corresponding Lie algebra. So. I have my Lie group capital K. By small k, I will always denote the Lie algebra of this group. So then I can take an element from the Lie algebra, consider one parameter subgroup in uh, the group K, 
And then by phi, it is mapped into <clears throat> one parameter uh, subgroup acting on uh, my uh, manifold M. And then I can differentiate this thing. And this way, I'm getting the fundamental vector field. This is like a, a standard construction. So once again here, what will be important for me is that this map, which associates to an element of the Lie algebra, this fundamental vector field is a homomorphism of Lie algebra. So for every element from the Lie algebra K, so for every X, I associate a vector field X hat, and we have this relation here. <clears throat> Okay, and now what is uh, also important is that since this action of the group K on M preserves symplectic structure, every fundamental vector field is Hamiltonian. Okay, this is immediate because we know that the Lie derivative in the direction of the fundamental vector field of omega is zero, and this is basically how we defined Hamiltonian vector fields. Okay. So under the previous assumptions that like our manifold is topologically trivial and so on, we can uh, find functions mu x for every x in my Lie algebra, I can find a function mu x such that it will be a Hamiltonian for this vector field x hat, okay? So I will have a lot of Hamiltonians, but then I can organize them in a nicely, in a nice way Namely, I can choose this mu x to be linear in x. This is not difficult, and uh, this can be done due to the fact that everything here is finite dimensional. So I can simply calculate those functions for some basis and then say that the functions associated to other elements of, the, of my Lie algebra will be just combinations of those uh, functions which I uh, calculated for the, for the basis of this Lie algebra. Okay, so this is this is easy. We can choose this map mu to be uh, linear uh, in X. And this way, we are getting a, a map which is going from the manifold to K star. So it, for to every point in the manifold M, it associates a linear functional. And this linear functional is just evaluated at some X it got, just gives us this function mu x at, at the point p. So p is a point in the manifold. And this is called a momentum map. So I intentionally put here. So look, I very rarely put any uh, things like a, d, n, because I never know where to put them. But here I did it intentionally, because this, this momentum map yet is not a unique one. Okay, or at least we don't know it as unique. I want to make it somehow unique. And <clears throat> so then non-uniqueness currently uh, follows from the fact that uh, uh, we need to satisfy this equation. So I'm now pointing at, at this equation with those functions mu x, which means that basically for every x, I can add a constant function, okay? I can take mu x, uh, bar plus some constant function, and this will be equally good Hamiltonian for this vector field x hat. So there is a freedom which relies on adding any linear functional belonging to k star. Okay, this will be equally good momentum map. But now we want to connect all those elements that I described so far. So we have Hamiltonian vector fields, we have functions, and we have the we have our Lie algebra. So we know that from the Lie algebra, we can go to the Hamiltonian vector fields by uh, construction, which is just taking a fundamental vector field associated to the element of the Lie algebra. From the functions, <clears throat> we know also how to construct a Hamiltonian vector field. It's just by this. Uh, uh, this musical isomorphism. And uh, I want to also be able to go from K to, to, so from the Lie algebra, K to the functions in a way which will be once again a homomorphism. Currently, <clears throat> it, might, it might not be a homomorphism, but I have this freedom of add, adding arbitrary linear functional new. 
And then it turns out, and I don't want to like go into details, that if the if the Lie algebra of the group which uh, is acting on our manifold is such that its first and second cohomology vanishes, then there always is such a choice of this new, and actually this choice is unique. So existence of this choice is guaranteed by the vanishing of H2 and uh, <clears throat> uniqueness by the vanishing of H1, such that this map from the Lie algebra to those functions will be once again homomorphic. Yes, so the uh, Hamiltonian associated, so Hamilton, Hamiltonian function associated to the commutator of X and Y, so of the two elements from the Lie algebra, will be given by the Poisson bracket of the corresponding Hamiltonians associated with X and Y. Good. <clears throat> so then a momentum map which satisfies this property will be called the momentum map. Okay. So this is the unique momentum map, uh, which goes from M to K star. And it has this property that <clears throat> this thing here, so this uh, arrow which connects K Lie algebra with the space of function is a homomorphism. So now I want to uh, add one more thing, namely I want to somehow translate this property that this is a homomorphism to something which would be uh, visible on the level of the action. So for this purpose, I need to speak a little bit about a joint action. Okay, so we know that on every group we can define a joint action is just by taking, by conjugating a group element with uh, some other group element. But then we can differentiate this action and <coughs> uh, this way we will obtain a corresponding action on the Lie algebra. Okay, so this add G acting on some Lie algebra element is just this thing. So I'm taking the conjugation of G of x dx, and then I'm differentiating it at t equals zero. So this is uh, how I defined a joint action of the group on its Lie algebra. And then from the very beginning, I was assuming that this group which we will be dealing with is compact. And if the group is compact, then the Lie algebra has at, uh, an invariant with respect to the, this adjoint action inner product. Okay, so I will denote this inner product by this round uh, kind of inner product. It's different than the inner product on the Hilbert spaces we were speaking about because it was like uh, the brackets were of different shape. So I have this inner product which is uh, uh, preserved by the adjoint action. And now <clears throat> this allows me to actually identify K star with K in a meaningful way, in the way which it will be invariant with respect to the adjoint or co-adjoint action. Okay, and this is why I need, uh, I was speaking about this because I don't like this thing which is called K star. Uh, I don't want to work with Lina, I don't want to work with functionals on the Lie algebra, I want to work with the Lie algebra itself. And by this identification, I'm like getting rid of this K star. And from now on, in my language, momentum map will be a map from the symplectic manifold to the Lie algebra of the group, which is acting on this manifold uh, via symplectomorphisms. And <clears throat> this uh, map is such that First of all, the, if I take the inner product of mu, X, of mu with some x, some element from the Lie algebra, I am getting the corresponding Hamiltonian. Then it satisfies this property, which says that uh, uh, mu x is actually a Hamiltonian of the vector field x. And there is this third property, which uh, I will call equivariance. So <clears throat> if I move on my manifold with this map, uh, with, with this action phi of the group K, of the group K, then there is a corresponding action uh, of uh, corresponding action which moves the the image mu p. So I take a point p 
its image under the momentum map is p, mu p. So then the corresponding action here, which is a natural action, is the adjoint action. And those two things uh, uh, are combined by this equation number three. And this equivariance here is actually equivalent to the fact that <clears throat> this map, which I was showing here, this, uh, this, this, this uh, which connects uh, Lie algebra to space of functions, is a homomorphism. Okay, so now mm, from this action uh, of, of, of the group K, I get some orbits. This uh, so uh, by OP, I will denote an orbit of the action of the group K on M through P. And then if I have a point P, I can calculate its image under the momentum map, it's mu P, and then there will be corresponding a joint orbit. Yes, it's ad G mu P over all the elements. Good. So on a picture, it looks like this. I have the symplectic manifold. There is action of the group K. It gives me an orbit. And then there is this momentum map mu. It takes this thing to the Lie algebra. And then there is mu P and the corresponding <clears throat> adjoint orbit. So mu maps this OP onto this uh, adjoint orbit omega mu P. And then there is an important fact, namely that those adjoint orbits or co-adjoint orbits, but I am sticking to the notion of adjoint, are symplectic manifolds. So there is some canonical symplectic form on them, which is basically given by this formula. I can calculate it easily using this invariant inner product, which I defined previously, and just the commutator. Uh, so this is uh, this is uh, uh, easily done, and then what one can see due to the fact that our momentum map is equivariant is that the pullback of this canonical uh, symplectic form on the adroit orbit through mu to m gives us the symplectic structure on the manifold M. So this is uh, this is what I'm writing here. And <clears throat> immediately like connecting those uh, things, like joining those, those facts together, one can deduce that an orbit OP, so that an orbit through a point P is symplectic if and only if this map from the orbit to the adjoint orbit, corresponding adjoint orbit is the thermomorphism. Okay, so basically, <clears throat> uh, this is a necessary and sufficient condition for an orbit to be symplectic. And then uh, we can, of course, uh, have possibly non-symplectic orbits, and one can somehow try to measure how non-symplectic is an orbit. And this can be done, for example, by checking how degenerate is the restriction of omega, which is a symplectic form on M, to this orbit. And this degeneracy, like if I want to, to measure it quantitatively, I can simply say that this, uh, this measure will be the dimension of this degeneracy. Uh, and it can be calculated uh, by simply subtracting the dimension of this orbit OP from the dimension of the corresponding adjoint orbit, okay? Because basically what this mu is doing, mu is the action of uh, when mu is taking a tangent vectors to OP, which belong to this uh, mm, degeneracy space, mu is killing them because it has to get rid of them because Omega is a symplectic manifold. It cannot have it, it, this uh, the, this omega capital omega cannot have any degeneracy. So mu is like uh, <clears throat> uh, mu is getting rid of this the degeneracy space uh, from OP. Good. So now <clears throat> I want to relate this. So I just reviewed this story about how to construct momentum map and uh, also how to <clears throat> somehow uh, decide whether orbits are symplectic or not symplectic. 
and uh, how to maybe quantitatively measure non-simplicity of an orbit. And I want now connect this story to our story about quantum systems. Okay, so the natural thing uh, which uh, allows us to connect those two stories is the fact that actually complex projective space is a color manifold. So in particular, it's a symplectic manifold. And one can consider, for example, action of the full unitary group. So I have a complex projective space, which is coming from this Hilbert space H. And now I'm considering the action of the unitary group uh, on this space. The, uh, this action is transitive. Okay, so I can connect any two points via this action of SUH on PH, which means also that uh, uh, the fundamental vector fields corresponding to this action actually give me the tangent space at every point. They span the tangent space at every point. So now, since they span the tangent space, I can uh, say that I can. it's actually uh, kind of convenient for me to define a symplectic form on PH in terms of those fundamental vector fields corresponding to this SUH action. And it's given just by inner product structure. Yes, H has the inner product, and I can define this uh, uh, symplectic form on PH in this way. Okay, and because, so if you look at this formula, it's basically straightforward because we know that the uh, inner product on the Hilbert space preserves, is invariant with respect to the unitary uh, action. So it means that the symplectic form is also invariant with respect to this SUH uh, action. Okay, so we have basically the action which uh, is a symplectomorphism. So now I can ask, ask, what is the corresponding momentum map for this action? And this momentum map is actually, uh, in this case, it's actually a little bit boring because it's just, it takes the state, okay, so a, a point in the projective space, and it associates to it a projection on the vector. So I should probably also divide it by the length just to make this uh, really a projection. So it's a, or every time when I, I'm writing a vector, I mean that this vector has length one. Okay, so then I don't need to divide by anything. So this is a projection onto the vector V and I shift it by this one over dimension of the, of the space identity because our momentum map should be, should be, should have values, should have, should have, have values in the Lie algebra and Lie algebra SUH is an algebra of traceless matrices. So I have to somehow make this thing traceless. So that's why I'm uh, shifting it by this uh, identity operator. And I multiply it by imaginary unit because it should be anti-Hermitian rather than Hermitian. Okay, so this way we get mm, momentum map. So basically what is the momentum map corresponding to the action of the full unitary group on the projective space of a Hilbert space H? It's just the density matrix corresponding to the state psi. Shift it a little bit and multiply it by i doesn't matter. So what is the information which is encoded in this momentum map? It's just the information about all the expected values of all the observables we can measure on our full system. Okay, so this is not really very interesting because first of all, the action is transitive. So there is only one orbit and then there is only one adjoint orbit. So this is just a story of two orbits. So uh, a little bit boring, but to some extent we want to connect now this thing to the picture with correlations. So I should now not consider just a Hilbert space, by, but a Hilbert space with a structure. So it will be H1 tensor H2. And for simplicity and not to like have multiple indices and so on, I will just assume that those two spaces are of the same dimension. And then the group action, which I want to consider is something that actually 
it's this group K, which is the, the, the product of SUD and SUD. So these are the two copies of the unitary group. Each copy is acting independently on H1 and H2. Okay, so this first SUD is acting on H1, second SUD is acting on H2. And this action is natural, it's just I'm, in, I'm embedding this action naturally into SUD square. So U1, U2, I just take the tensor product of U1 and U2. This is now a matrix which is unitary and belongs to the full unitary group, SUH. And U1 times U2 acting on some simple <clears throat> tensor V1, V2 is, is given by this. And then we extend it by linear. Okay, so now this group K is much smaller than uh, the full unitary group SUD square. So there will be potentially many orbits. And then some of them will be maybe symplectic, some will be non-symplectic. And then you can ask the question how this uh, <clears throat> property of being symplectic or not symplectic is related to the the fact that something is entangled or not entangled. Okay, so but to make this connection, let's <clears throat> look at the orbits uh, of the action of K on this projective uh, space. So they are given by this. So I'm taking U1 tensor U2, it's acting on Psi. U1 and U2 is ranging over SUD. And <clears throat> then because I want to also have the formula for omega, because the formula for omega is needed to derive the formula for mm, uh, is needed to derive formula for the corresponding momentum map. I want to also have the momentum map of this k action. So the tangent vectors uh, corresponding to the Lie algebra of k will be given by uh, this uh, kind of uh, fundamental vector fields. And the corresponding, and this is actually like the crucial point of, of, this, uh, of this whole derivation, is that the momentum map corresponding to the K action, so the action of this SUD cross SUD on, P, on the projective space of this system of two particles, is uh, given by this formula here, where this rho one and rho two are those reduced states, which we derived in a quite different way two weeks ago. So those uh, partial traces uh, of, of, of a state of a full system, which are the states of the first subsystem and second uh, subsystem, they are basically what is our momentum map in this case. And of course, I have to shift them by this uh, something proportional to identity to make things uh, to belong to this SUD plus SUD Li algebra, but these are like the technical things. And I multiply it also by imaginary unit to make everything anti-Hermitian rather than her Hermitian. Okay, so what we learn is that this the momentum map corresponding to the K action is something which consists of reduced density matrices, reduced states, and Therefore, it contains much less information. It contains only information about one cubic measurements, not the measurements of the full system, but just of the, its constituents. Okay. You started, now, you started, to, you started to use it using your, 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 your Argo or whatever this QDIT. So you never define so state again that QDIT is something, is that state or something, right? Ah, okay. So maybe it was one. Uh, uh, one uh, one or two weeks ago. So Q did if as if you if we have uh, something which lives in the d dimensional space, we call it Q did. So a quantum system whose uh, Hilbert space is d dimensional is called Q did. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Good. Sorry, it, it probably I uh, maybe I forgot to do it. It's like uh, uh, it's somehow it's very hard to give such talks. I would say because uh, you have to define everything. 
<laughs> and very often uh, it's very likely that that, that you, you one 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 will forget about some small detail. So maybe this is this small small detail. Whatever. <clears throat> okay. So now uh, I want to mm, consider this picture. Okay. So we have this complex uh, projective space which describes our system consisting of two subsystems, which are d-dimensional. That's why I'm calling them QDs. So these are two QDs, okay? And then I have this uh, uh, orbit of psi. So I'm taking some state, pure state, psi. And <clears throat> uh, these are all the states which uh, are which belong to the, to the orbit, uh, of this uh, of, of my k group and then this momentum map is taking this thing into a into the lie algebra small k and then here i have the adjoint orbit okay this adjoint orbit consists of uh, those uh, the matrices like this so u1 so the first matrix which is acting on the first <coughs> subsystem is conjugating mu1 tilde, this is this mu1 tilde, the first component of the momentum map, and the second one is conjugating mu2 tilde. So this is a, a usual adjoint action. Good, and now we want to understand, we want to somehow mm, understand when this orbit here is symplectic, and if it is not symplectic, how to actually calculate this degeneracy. And how this, this degeneracy of the restriction of omega to the orbit changes when we are taking different states. And for this purpose, I need to actually do some calculations. It's like up to now, I was not doing any calculations, but at some point, one has to calculate something. So <clears throat> what, I, what I am doing is uh, I'm, answer, I, I'm now dealing with this question, which I actually just stated, for which states psi or psi the, 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 the corresponding orbit is symplectic. Okay, <clears throat> or in other words, how the degeneracy of uh, restriction of the symplectic form omega to the orbit is related to the entanglement properties of state psi. So let's take any state psi from our two particle, from our two system uh, Hilbert space. It can be written like this. E, I, and F, uh, J, these are the basis of H1 and H2. So then I can calculate the corresponding uh, reduced states. I'm not showing these calculations, so to some extent you have to believe me. They are given by the simple formulas. This is just C, C dagger, and then C transpose C bar, where C is this matrix here, matrix of the coefficients of this tensor. And then what happens to this state psi when I'm as acting on it with U and V? So with some SUD matrix here and SUD matrix here. So U and V are as two SUD matrices. Once again, by doing simple calculation, you can see that actually this uh, tensor C, the, the, this Cij, is changed into U acting on C and V transposed. So you are taking the product of those three matrices and you are taking the element ij. This is how the tensor is transformed. And so look, here we have a square matrix. It's any matrix. And then I'm like multiplying it on the left with some unitary and on the right with some unitary because V transport is, is uh, still a unitary matrix. Using two unitary matrices, I can always diagonalize any matrix. Doesn't matter what is this matrix. So this is the, so I'm just now doing this thing which is called singular value decomposition. So I'm, <clears throat> so we can choose U and V basically such that this Psi will be moved by this U and V to a state which I will denote by Psi C. It's a canonical form of this state. So this is a special point on the orbit. And this special point on the orbit is just a summation over one index i, and it's given by this. And the corresponding density matrices, row one and row two, 
are also diagonal in this case. And so we know what, are, what is on the diagonal of the density matrices. These are the probabilities. So those probabilities here are exactly the same for both row one and row two, which is kind of important that they are the same. And then in the state, we just take the roots of those probabilities. <clears throat> so this is, uh, so I have a special point on the orbit in M. Okay, so going back here, there will be a special point here, which is this canonical form of the state Psi. And then the corresponding special form, uh, which are the diagonal matrices, row one and row two. So now I want to calculate this degeneracy. Uh, how the generate is a symplectic form in this special point. If I calculate the dimension of the degeneracy in this special point, it will be uh, the same in every other point on the orbit because this action is by a symplectomorphism. Okay, so <clears throat> I should calculate the dimension of the orbit and subtract the dimension of the corresponding adjoint orbit. This can be also done just by calculating the stabilizers. So I can calculate the stabilizer, dimension of the stabilizer of the, or the isotropic group of this uh, uh, momentum map image and the state uh, in this canonical form. So how to calculate those things? It's actually not very difficult. And I, I don't want to carry out all those calculations. I just want to show you an intuition behind it because uh, this is just... So <clears throat> if I, for example, want to calculate the stabilizer of this image of the momentum map. So the image of the momentum map consists basically of this row one and row two. They are shifted by identity, but it doesn't matter. Okay, so I will have some diagonal matrix which has some spectrum P1, P2, and so on up to PD. And then <clears throat> I want to uh, find all the matrices U such that if I conjugate it with this, I will get once again, this diagonal matrix, okay? So in case when this, so you see that it should be somehow connected to the degeneracy of those piece here. Uh, <clears throat> and, so if all those P's are different, for example, the only matrix U which I can use is the diagonal unitary matrix to obtain uh, the same, once again, the same thing. If, for example, P1 and P2 are equal to each other, I can take a block diagonal matrix such that there will be a unitary block here and then <clears throat> arbitrary diagonal matrix in the rest. So basically, <clears throat> Using such a reasoning and doing it carefully and so on, one can actually derive a formula for the degeneracy of this uh, symplectic uh, <clears throat> form at the state uh, psi, and it's given by this this the uh, this formula here, where we have a sum from n one to r, m n square minus one. So what are all those things? This r is a number of non-zero PIs. So we are calculating row one and row two, those, uh, those uh, reduced states. There are some Ps here. Some of them can be zero. So I don't want to count those which are zero. <clears throat> I am just taking those which are strictly positive. So this is R, this is the real number. And then mn square is the multiplicity of this of the pi. So these are basically okay. Uh, I'm actually lying a little bit. These are not only non-zero pi's. These are different non-zero pi's. Okay. So for example, if p1 and p2 are the, si the same, and they are non-zero, they will be counted as one p1. Okay. And then uh, their degeneracy will be m1, which is 2. And then I will take the square of this, OK? <clears throat> so this is how I, this is a compact form formula for this degeneracy based on the, mm, on the multiplicities of the eigenvalues of the reduced states. And now let's look at this degeneracy. So if I take a separable state, a separable state uh, or non-entangled state, I remind you, it's a state which is a simple tensor. 
If it is a simple tensor, then the corresponding canonical form will be once again simple tensor, because by the local unitary action, I cannot change simple tensor into something which is not simple tensor. But this form will be such that only one pi will be non-zero, and it will be one, and the others will be zero. So this will be the <clears throat> this, this, this is how PIs are looking for a separable state. So there is one non-zero element, which is one, and all others are zero. So basically, MN, there is only R is one. There is only one MN, which is one, and one minus one is zero. So the degeneracy is zero. So this is, so the orbit through separable states, actually orbit containing all separable states, is the only symplectic orbit in the uh, in the in the complex projective space of this k uh, k action, and <clears throat> I can perform similar calculations for all the other things, all the other orbits, but it's actually instructive to do this calculation for this thing which we called previously the maximally entangled state. Okay, the state for which uh, this uh, reduced states are proportional to identity. So one over D and all the ones, okay? So then there is only one <clears throat> eigenvalue, which is non-zero. Once again, it's one, but it has a very big multiplicity. This multiplicity is D. So it will be D square minus one. D square minus one is actually the half of the dimension of the pro uh, complex projective space, half of the uh, real dimension of the complex projective space. And at the same time, we can also calculate that this is also the dimension of the orbit through this state. Adam, <laughs> yes? Adam can I ask you? Yes, so, please. So it was, was unclear why you say you don't want to consider zero PIs. They do contribute to stabilizer, right? To stabilizer, their of course. So uh, look, they they contribute to the stabilizer of mu, but they also contribute to the stabilizer of psi, and those contribution cancels. That's why I can uh, not I, I I delete them because you see. In, in the at the end we are interested in the formula for this degeneracy space which is the difference between the dimension of the two stabilizers okay, okay. yeah I just told I, I just told you a story about the one of the stabilizers there are there is similar story connected to this stabilizer and then those things which corresponds to zero uh here and here are the same and they will cancel so that's why uh, we neglect them. Uh, they, they do not appear explicitly in the formula. Okay, good. So coming back to this maximally entangled state, we see that the degeneracy is half of the dimension of the whole projective space. And this is also the dimension of the orbit which co contains this maximally entangled states. So, it means that all the maximally entangled states, they belong to one orbit. And this orbit is very special because the restriction of the symplectic form to this orbit is just zero. So this is a Lagrangian orbit. Okay, so we have kind of a gradation which uh, somehow gives us uh, the following uh, um, conclusion, I would say that the more non-symplectic is the k-orbit, uh, the more entangled states are on this k-orbit. Okay, so this is like uh, like the, 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 the final conclusion. And how can we somehow think about it if we want to connect it a little bit more to physics? It's... Uh, at least how I think about it, is via this uh, uh, interpretation of uh, everything what is symplectic, yes? So we know that uh, phase spaces are symplectic manifolds, so everything that is symplectic for me should be 
<coughs> classical. Okay, so those separable states are somehow very classical from the point of view of uh, this uh, this kind of uh, reasoning which I which I just uh, presented. It's like because they they belong to a space, they form a space which has a structure that is also present in the classical mechanics. The more entangled states I am taking, the more non-symplectic this thing is, the, the, the less it resembles the, the phase space. And if the states are maximally entangled, this symplectic structure, which is somehow connected to the classical picture, vanishes completely. OK, good. Basically, I think this time I was really on time because it's half past uh, half past two now. So uh, that's all I, what I wanted to say, basically. So if you have more questions, I'm very happy to, to answer. Thank you very much. Thank you. So other questions? So uh, uh, the, the orbits which are maximally entangled, right? So they are a lot of them. No. Ah, uh, no, no. It's Max actually maximal entropy. They, 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 they... Uh, so look, uh, Boris, uh, right. because it, uh, so look, uh, because you also wrote me this email asking about the rank of a state. So maybe I will now comment about it. Yes, there will be a lot of orbits that will, uh, there will be a lot of K orbits with states of the maximal rank. Okay. But among all those orbits, there will be one which is going through a state uh, of the maximal rank but such that its coefficients are all the same. Uh, I'm going back now to the formula for a state. Oh, it's here. You see this state? It's not only of the maximal rank. It has e e exactly the same uh, coefficients standing uh, in front of every uh, basis vector here, yes? Mm -hmm. and, and this orbit through this state is Lagrangian. If I, for example, uh, allow those coefficients here to be different, not all the same, the corresponding orbit will not be Lagrangian any longer. It will be just co-isotropic. So it will be it, it will not be totally degenerated orbit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good. So if there if there are if there are more particles, the 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 story will be similar. If there is yeah, like... this is very good question, because I presented you the most simple version of this story, and this story actually starts to be really interesting if you have more particles than two, because then you not only so typically you will not have Lagrangian orbits, and this is because. Uh, to, to call an orbit Lagrangian, it has to have a dimension of the half of the full space. But uh, I don't know. So the argument here, uh, why, will, why we will not have Lagrangian orbit is like a dimensional argument, okay? So let's say that you have uh, four subsystems and each of them has uh, dimension two. So the full... Hilbert space has dimension 16, yes? And then the K group, which you will consider, will be four copies of SU2. So the corresponding dimension will be what? Uh, the corresponding dimension will be four times uh, three, which is 12, but this is real dimension 12. And the real dimension of the projective space uh, in this case is 32. So there is no way that the orbit, which is 12, will be the half of this. Uh, there, it, it cannot be 15 dimensional. So, but there will be a lot of isotropic orbits. Also the orbits where the symplectic form vanishes, but they will not have the, the uh, dimension of the, they will be not be Lagrangian because of this dimensional reason. And actually then, <clears throat> All those orbits uh, which, uh, for which uh, this symplectic form vanishes, they can be identified with uh, very important classes of states 
but I didn't define these classes of states in this talk, but there is, yes, this, this picture is transferable to the more particles, and when we have more subsystems or more particles, it's much more interesting. But it requires a lot of more of talking. <laughs> So, so what is the interpretation of, of the entanglement? So if you move one particle, this other should, well, if it's if it's entangled state, so it should uh, compensate in order that uh, the motion happens on Lagrangian manifold. So how how, how actually we can see it? Uh, so no, no, this Lagrangian thing is only about maximally entangled. Okay, the the thing so. <clears throat> I'm not sure that I fully like understand the question. So we, we are saying that we when we are like doing some operation on the one particle, then the other ones should what once again? Can you repeat it? it should kind of, yeah. So what happens to the other particle if they are maximally entangled, right? So so you 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 change one particle and the other should compensate it that the uh well the motion happens on this genre manifold. Uh, not really. It's like so look. The point is that so the what Adam is... Adam 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 uh, I think that Boris question is give a physical interpretation of this maximally entangled state. Can you say something? Okay, so this is basically this. So I I think that the best way of understanding is by this. Uh, <clears throat> the, if we want to speak about it physically, is going back to this picture which I was showing you two weeks ago with those mixed states. Yes, a mixed state is a state which is made from some pure states, but this is a statistical composition, so a probabilistic composition. So somehow you don't know what kind of a state you were given, and you don't know it not because uh, of some quantum rules whatsoever. It's because, let's say, a machine which is producing these states can produce either psi one or psi two. Okay, and then there is some ambiguity, and now, uh, so this is how I un how we understand mixed states. They are states in which we don't have some knowledge about uh, uh, about a state. Okay, and now look how I understand maximally entangled states. So, I take a state, I take a pure state of the of this system consisting of two subsystems, CD, CD, okay? So I basically, if state is a pure state, I know everything what I can know about the system in this state. It's like, seems like the full knowledge. And now what I want to do, I'm asking the question, what are the states of those subsystems? And it turns out that for this maximally entangled state, Actually, we, this is how we define this maximally entangled states. Those reduced states are mixed, and they are actually totally mixed. Namely, if you look at those matrices row one and row two, the probability distribution, so those uh, eigenvalues are all the same. This is a uniform, uh, this uniform probability, uniform discrete probability distribution. So this is the so basically you don't know anything about the states of the subsystems. So this is a paradoxical situation where you should you should you have a full knowledge about the whole system, but if you want to say something about subsystems, it turns out that you cannot say anything about what is their state. What are what are their states? They are completely mixed. They with uh, probability one over d. They are one of those uh, <clears throat> one of uh, one of them one of any elements of any orthonormal basis. So, so if it was if it was the similar similar state, but with some uh, different probabilities in in different places, but still all of them. So why? So that would be also very mixed, but in some sense less mixed, right? Less mixed because so look, <clears throat> it's like uh, 
We know that the most entropic probability distribution is the uniform distribution, because then everything is li equally likely, so there is no bias towards any choice, yes? So not knowing anything means that something is uniform, because you have no clue what you should, yeah, yeah, yeah. what it can be. If one of the probabilities is like much bigger than all the others, you actually right, know right. something. Yeah, sorry. So in your, your in your approach, you use the most standard uh, momentum map. But are you familiar or have you ever considered the more general momentum maps to your approach? Uh, sorry, it's like uh, uh, I was reading some message someone wrote on the chat when you were saying, can you repeat this question? I, I really apologize. Yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. I mean, I know that I'm aware that there are more general construction, more general notion. There is more general notion of the momentum map than than the standard one you you used. And my question is, have you ever considered to to apply this more general general approach notion mm -hmm. of the momentum map? This more general uh, construction. It's a good question. It's like I'm not an expert in this. It's like I'm not a. I'm not like I'm not specializing in uh, symplectic or differential geometry. I know some things which I read in some books. It's like uh, so. What is this generalized momentum map thing? It's like if I have a compact group acting on a compact manifold, I can get something more from this construction, which you which you are calling generalized. I mean, yeah, in in general, you can, and I think that the most general definition of the of the momentum map, and it's called it is it's in, it was introduced by by Ratio, and it's called G-valued momentum maps, and it's for instance the standard momentum map you showed the special case of the G-valued momentum map, but. And yeah. what is this in the G-valued momentum map? Uh, well, it's all. I mean, the the definition is more complicated, but because okay. you define. So yeah, I mean, it sounds it, it sounds like I can send you, you yeah. can send me something, and then we can even speak about it. It's like I'm really happy to 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 learn something new, and maybe it will be useful. Okay. Okay. Description. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh Adam, maybe I'll try again. So we, we consider two particles, right? And we consider state where, where they, they're most entangled, right? Mm -hmm. So and you can't really say anything about one particle, right? Because it's it's actually yeah. in, in most uh, yeah um, general state. But I mean, if you know something about one particle, right? Then you actually can say something about the second one. The state is uh. most mixed, right? And, and, and yes, this is like a uni uniform, but... I mean, when you, when you actually know information about one particle, you 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 can. Okay, so uh, look, what we can one. say. Mm -hmm. So what I can do is, if we go back to this, if you want to char some characterization of all states which are maximally entangled, could be also. So it's due to the fact that we have this action. So now, if you put here C. Uh, for the maximally entangled state, this is identity matrix, roughly, yes? So then it means that all the states which are maximally entangled are actually tensors for which the corresponding matrix, the Cij, is a unitary matrix or like one over D unitary matrix, something like this. It's not an arbitrary matrix here. It's a unitary matrix. This is one of the of the ways you can view it. But I mean, you use this uh, two unitary matrices to identify. You have CD and CD, right? And then you actually consider basis on them, which you actually identify these two copies, right? And then if you say that one particle, which you denote by E, is localized in state like E3, e like in third basis vector, then actually your seconds should be should do the same, right? 
yeah, if if you want to, if but uh, I cannot then just your, your, your identification, which actually gives you uh, uh, this diagonalization. But I cannot, so Boris. Look, the point is that I cannot say that my first particle is localized in the state E one, for example, you because it, and you find happens. out that it's actually there. Uh, if I find out, so yes. look, what we are, no, okay, understand. Look, there. look, yes, yes, yes. I know. Uh, I now understand what you are. Uh, asking about so if i now make a measurement okay of the first particle and i will discover that this first particle is in the state for example e3 it means that the second particle is immediately in the state f3 yeah okay yeah okay and, 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 and you use here maximal entanglement for this right uh, I so if I want to have this thing for every basis vector, I need to use this uh, this uh, the, this thing. Yes. Actually, no. I don't. For this, I don't need to have a maximally entangled state. For having what I just said is enough to have a uh, tensor of the full rank. Full rank. So that will be still. Wait. It will be still. Uh, as that. Uh, oh, look. No, Orbit, right? So, if we if you go back to this, mm -hmm. if you go back to this story which I was telling two weeks ago, when you are doing a measurement, your system is collapsing to some state, yes, and then it's collapsing to some state with some probability. So the maximally entangled state is such that if you like measure your system and you will find out that it's in the. Uh, state E1 or E2 or E3 and so on, then there is the same probability of finding the system in those, if you, of finding this first particle in all those states. And then in the same, uh, in the, you understand, do you, do you, do you? Um, yeah, 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 all the probabilities are the same. So all the results, like you can have either as the result of your measurement, E1 on the first particle and F1 on the second, or with equal probability, E2, F2, E3, F3, and so on. If you have a state which is not like this, it's not maximally entangled, there will be, for example, I don't know, big probability that E1, F1 is the result and small probability that E2, F2 is the result, okay? So some will be like, uh, more likely than something else. Okay. And, and what happens maximal if I do measurement? And what happens if I do measurement and find the first particle is in this uh, uh, E1 plus E2? Then what you have to vector, but 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 E1 plus E2. Then what you have to simply you you simply have to. Uh, apply so if if your state is in uh, yeah. so you find that it is in e1 plus e2 state it means that you have measured an self adjoint operator which has this e1 plus e2 as an eigenvector yes so now you are taking a projection operator and this projection operator is doing what it's like projecting to e1 plus e2 on the first particle and is doing nothing on the other particle so you have to write down your state in a such a way that is this e1 plus e2 is somehow <clears throat> uh, the first part of a state and then it's tensor producted with some other i don't know psi it, it will not be in this schmidt form you have to change this form but you can do it unitarily. Yeah. So, so if it's maximally uh, uh, entangled, then the, the second particle will be in the state f1 plus, plus f2. But if it's just maximal rank, then there are some coefficients appear there. Is it correct? Yes, there will be some coefficients. That's yeah. true. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Good. Okay. So maybe uh, one more question. I mean, because for every, I mean, for uh, Lee group, a compact Lee group acting canonically, you can, you have an associated momentum map, which is ad equivariant, as you said, but uh, do you know, have you encountered an example where the momentum map is not ad equivariant? Uh, 
Uh, so I don't think in this picture you will have such a case because uh, all the groups which are interesting from the perspective of those correlations and so on, they are semi-simple. Okay. Okay, I see. Thank you. Okay, send that again. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much for the. Thank you very the, much. Very, very clear talk. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks.